Uh, I prepared a paper, but I'm going to uh, just raise some issues because I would like us to have a conversation around this, uh, those issues. Um, I um, have, um, I will just go through the, um, the I'll, I'll just leave the uh, uh, table of content or the outline, so, and I will speak around it. Um, in many, in the cosmology of uh, African societies in general, the woman, the African woman is considered to be the custodian of the earth. And as a result, she has a responsibility in the fertility, taking care of the fertility of the, the land, taking care of the trees and everything that goes on the land. And uh, that's why, you know, in the Western feminist discourse that um, articulates a private sphere where the women are confined and a public sphere where men operate. Uh, I have argued that it doesn't fit exactly the African sociological and historical reality because although women are responsible for what happens in the domestic sphere, it's an extension of what they do outside. They are producers. They do not wait to receive the product, to be involved in the transformation, conservation, and preparation. They do all that, but they do it uh, as producers. So there is a very dynamic relationship between the outside world where food is produced and the inside world where it is prepared and distributed to the, the family. So historically, African women have been uh, firmly located and knowing also that even today, while the process of uh, urbanization is, uh, is um, going faster and faster and the proportion of the people living in urban areas is, is growing, which explains in part uh, why cassava is becoming so important, uh, a cash crop. At the same time, the majority of the African people still live in rural areas and agriculture is still very important. And women have been historically, as I mentioned, involved and actually in charge of agriculture. You have different patterns that we may not have time to go through in terms of the food production, men and women's participation. If you compare West Africa as you go into East Africa and Southern Africa, you see major differences. As you go from agrar agrarian societies to pastoral societies, you see differences. In West Africa, for example, is typically an illustration of the uh, concept of complementarity. Men and women are involved in the production of the same commodity. As men clear the field, and then women do a certain job, and then men come, for example, the production of the yam, which is uh, uh, predominant in a specific uh, ethnic group, such as the Igbos in Nigeria, uh, the uh, Baules in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, and some Senufos. Um, the production of yam requires that men clear the field, and then uh, cutting the uh, trees, and then women come to do some work to organize, and then men come back to make those uh, yam mound that require so much energy. And then women come back to put the uh, uh, yam seeds, the uh, pieces in it. So all the way to the production. Of course, when um, uh, uh, you look at the total time invested in, in the end, you find out that women spend more time because they are involved not only in the production of those key cash crops, but they are involved in the production of everything that goes around, the vegetables, all those plants that are in association with the main crop, whether it is um, plantain or uh, yam or the different types of, uh, uh, of cereals. 
So in the end, the woman really fulfills that um, cosmological responsibility of uh, being in charge of the uh, fertilization of the land and the production of, of the land. And of course, as in any situation, when you have a custody, it comes with responsibility, but it comes also with right. So women have been involved heavily in the production, agricultural production, but historically they have been also the ones who manage most of the agricultural production. Since it was produced mostly for the consumption, even when a crop, for example, the yam, there are some varieties that are supposed to be the man's crop. But in the end, the women are the ones who prepare it and distribute it to the family. So one way or the other, from the beginning to the end of the whole process, women play that central role. And with the division of the space, uh, social space, um, the kitchen, uh, traditionally in the African context, the kitchen is separated from the main house. And the space where food is prepared, water is stored, is a space that is really almost sacred, off limit for the men. Women are the ones. So the food that comes out that men, men eat is the food that women decide to bring out. <laughs> uh, they're usually responsible, uh, feel responsibility for the entire family, and therefore they will distribute the food. But what I'm saying is the potential uh, capacity to decide to bring out what men will consume. So that's considerable power in the context of an economy that is focusing more, mostly on producing to meet the need of the family. So there are different uh, staple foods, uh, as, as you know, and uh, people historically are very much tied to their own staple food. Those who consume cereal, when they ask you, have you eaten? It means, have you eaten something out of the kind of cereal that the group consumes? Uh, among those who consume uh, um, the uh, tuber type of food, such as yam, when they ask you, have you eaten today? It means, have you eaten anything uh, prepared with yam? Because everything else is not really food. I remember one of my first uh, jobs, I was still a graduate student uh, when I went back home to collect my uh, data. And one of my colleagues at the university, because uh, before I came to, the, to North America for my PhD, uh, when I finished my second master's in France, I went back home and worked one year at the university. And so I worked with a group, a team, in a, in a center uh, for uh, architectural and urban studies. And I was involved uh, in, uh, in uh, some work. And one of my former colleagues from that experience invited me to join him for a consultancy job. And that consultancy job was to um, introduce rice as a cash crop in an area that had been heavily affected by migration because of land exertion, all sorts of uh, issues with land availability, many people migrated to the, another region of the country, living really desolate situation where only old people uh, uh, were staying, even if they maintained their relation with their home. So there was that effort to find activities that will prevent that continued migration, drainage of the uh, adult population to other regions. So when we were, this is an area where the yam is the main conception. Yam is almost uh, sacred. One of the biggest celebration in, in, the, in the traditional culture is the yam, the new yam uh, festival. You don't consume it until that festival takes place. So yam is almost sacred. So when we arrive initially in that place, it's like, what are you talking about? You bringing rice here? <laughs> so we did our work. I'm also partly a sociologist. So we did, and my other colleague is a sociologist. So we did our work uh, collecting information and so and so forth. 
I was quite pleased when many, many years later, I returned home and this colleague told me, you will not believe it. People are fighting to find a piece of land for rice. Well, it was still considered the food for birds, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can sell it and make money. So you don't need to migrate to go to develop a, a cocoa coffee farm in the West, far away from home. So if you're going to give us money, we will <laughs> go with it. So these are some of the, the uh, issues that I want to, to bring here. This, um, the, the changing meaning of agricultural production. As I mentioned initially, agriculture was for the uh, consumption of the family. Then at, at the turn of the uh, end of uh, 19th century, beginning of 20th century, the whole African continent, its tradition, its social institutions were affected as a result of colonization. And so um, the, what is uh, usually called cash crops, those commodities that the Europeans introduced and specialized specific countries in, Senegal, you grow peanut. <laughs> uh, Guinea, you grow bananas. Uh, Kenya, you grow coffee and tea. Uganda, you grow coffee. So all this uh, was done by the European. For them, it was, there was complementarity because France could count on its peanut in, 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 uh, in Senegal and uh, coffee and cocoa from Cote d'Ivoire and so on and so forth. For, but for those countries, it was reducing their economy to the monoculture or a few cultures. And this transformed significantly social relations, the production, the relation between people and the land, and so and so forth. There is a tradition in the African context where when a woman marries, she typically joins the community of her husband, what is called the patrilocal tradition. However, she has a sacred right, land use. No matter how far the, the new family she's joining is, when she arrives, she has the right to land, to cultivate, to actualize this idea that the woman really is at the center of the agricultural production. And land was not the object of a personal appropriation. It is for the collectivity. It is distributed to the people who, 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 who um, fertilize it, who use it to produce a food. And given the centrality of women in the agricultural production, uh, they received that piece of land uh, in the new families that they integrated. But then came this uh, European new model of agriculture, new meaning of ag agriculture. Agriculture as a means through which you make money. The monetization of the, the African economy. Monetization that was mot motivated by many factors. One, the African continent in the process of colonization was a land where they could have new market for the, in the context of industrialization, the commodities that were being produced. So the Africans were seen mostly as consumers. But you cannot be a consumer, a real consumer, if you cannot buy. So there was a need for them to make money in order to consume the transformed commodities. Another one was the uh, law that was adopted by all the colonial administration, regardless of their style, whether it is the French assimilation or the British in direct rule, they all instituted the head tax. And as a historian have seen in the text, in the archives, how much the African hated that head tax. By, by virtue of you know, my right to be born in what was called Gold Coast. I have to pay head tax to the British Crown. I'm born in what is a Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and I have to pay head tax to France. But in any case, in order to pay that head tax, they had to also make money. So there were many factors, uh, these uh, two being the most uh, critical one, uh, for creating a monetized economy. 
a source for um, um, uh, the African to have access to uh, uh, financial resources in order to pay the head tax and become consumers. And also the agriculture that was uh, introduced by the Europeans was uh, primarily to satisfy their own need. It was also a source for feeding the factories in Europe. Commodities that were produced in Africa before were integrated into that colonial economy where I come from, in Cote d'Ivoire, in that whole region of West Africa. Cotton was a very important commodity. Historically, um, you have seen the Tarzan film with the African uh, naked and so on and so forth. I wouldn't mind when it's cold, when it's uh, what, uh, uh, how many degrees here. Uh, you have to put all those things on. But when it's hot, I wouldn't mind wearing the basic. But in any case, the point I want to make is that cotton was very much important, and people were weaving. The, you may have seen the Kente cloth. Well, this is a, a, a modern version of all the sort of wide range of, of uh, cotton uh, product, uh, cloth, that people were producing. But cotton, like many other crops that were uh, uh, original plant from Africa, were integrated in that uh, colonial economy. Oil palm. There's the story of these women in Nigeria who protested the Abba women because of some rules that were being uh, uh, adopted by the colonial administration that would not be favorable to them. They protested, and many of them were shot and killed. Uh, the cotton in my own country was integrated. Uh, a factory was, uh, was uh, built, and as a result, women were dispossessed. The, because uh, they could no longer, there was a competition between the type of cloth that was being produced locally and the industrial production of cloth. So there is a whole range of issues regarding the type of uh, agricultural policies, the type of commodities that were introduced, the process through which the African crops were integrated into that colonial economy in order to satisfy the need of the colonial powers. So that's the context in which uh, coffee and cocoa were introduced in Cote d'Ivoire, the context in which um, cotton, oil palm, uh, coconut, all these were also integrated in that colonial economy. Uh, by the way, in, in terms of the coffee, today Cote d'Ivoire is uh, the first producer of cocoa in the world. But initially, <laughs> at, uh, in the beginning of colonization, when the Europeans were trying to find where they could plant what, they introduced experimentally coffee and cocoa in the southwest of the country. And in the context of colonization, with the status of uh, the native uh, uh, law, which reduced the Africans literally to enslaved people, they were ordered to do things that were beneficial to the administration. They were ordered to take care of those uh, plants uh, that were, they were experimenting. So what the people did was to certainly take care by watering the plant, but watering it with hot water. Because <laughs> they wanted to show that our soil is not good for this. You can go elsewhere. Of course, the investigators found out and, uh, and uh, forced them to take proper care. And just like uh, formal education that was rejected and eventually embraced, uh, the plantation economy was later embraced. And it's ironic that today Cote d'Ivoire is the first producer of cocoa in the world. And the production that is based on family plot is not like in Southern Africa, for instance, with the settler colonies, where, where you have large commercial farms. In West Africa, all these commodities are produced by families. Okay. So uh, in introducing the, these cash crops, it changed completely the entire economic system, the interpersonal communication, the family as a unit of production and consumption, the centrality of the women, all this was changed drastically. 
And then there became this hierarchy of the, the crops, the cash crops. In the monetizing economy, the cash crop became more important than the food crop. Yet at the same time, women had the responsibility of producing to feed the family and so and so forth. And then in terms of land, they were using the best land for those cash crops and so and so forth. And in the process also, uh, men became the sole, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the only members of the family who were controlling the new production of these cash crops. There's this major play by uh, Bernard Dadier on uh, where it shows uh, Yao Ajuba or something like that, the title. This woman who devoted all her time contributing to the cash crop and eventually there was a divorce and she had to leave behind all the fruit of her labor, which was different in the uh, initial context. So anyway, this is uh, the way the cash crops and food crop uh, were re reorganized, uh, took different significance in the society. And little by little, you have that gendered situation where the cash crop is associated with men and food crop is associated with the women. And so then cassava comes in that context. Cassava, to start with, was a very marginal crop in Cote d'Ivoire. It was introduced uh, a long time ago, centuries ago, with the Portuguese. This is the way it is traced, uh, maybe 16th century or something like that. Uh, but it was much later, in the 18th, 19th century, that it started to take root. But it took root only in the southern part of the country. Uh, I'll, I'll show you quickly here how, uh, okay, how uh, the, this is the cassava production in the world. Uh, Nigeria, number one, Brazil. And uh, in terms of export, it's, uh, it's indicated that Thailand is the country that has been the most advanced in the transformation of the cassava product and commercializing it. And you see um, Cote d'Ivoire, in Cote d'Ivoire, is very little. It comes as a 22nd, the, according to the classification, 22nd uh, producer in the world. Well, it's not a matter of the size of the population of anything. As I just mentioned, they are first producer of cocoa. It means any product that they consider to be significant, they can uh, uh, make it uh, uh, a, a major pr production uh, process. So it's, it's a reflection of how marginal it was historically. Only people in the coastal areas were consuming it. It, it grows easily. That's one of its characteristics. Uh, actually, it's very fascinating. There's a lot of research being done on various ground, various fronts, how um, in terms of its uh, capacity to contribute to food for human, animal, um, in, in the industrialization that I will mention uh, very briefly in the case of Cote d'Ivoire. Um, and it's, it's a capacity to adapt easily to even the poorest soil ability to go and uh, fetch those little minerals that it needs, even in the most infertile uh, uh, land, where yam, for example, would not succeed, and so and so forth. So it's very, very interesting uh, uh, plant, and a lot of research is, uh, is being conducted. But again, in, in Cote d'Ivoire, it was the coastal area. And um, among the um, people, as you, it doesn't grow and has not been uh, encouraged or adopted in the northern part of the country. It's only recently that it's moving up, although it could, it could uh, succeed there. So uh, those who uh, cultivated it, for example, yam eating people, for them, eating cassava is during the, what they consider to be famine. If there, even if there is a cassava in abundance, if there's no yam, it means they are starving and they would eat it. Yet at the same time, there is a saying back home uh, where I come from, uh, trying to compare maize to cassava, which one has the capacity of producing multiplicity of different types of food to feed a child. 
So there are many, many ways in which you can transform the cassava. And I will uh, briefly mention one of them, uh, uh, the acheke, which has become uh, almost uh, like a national uh, emblem in, in Cote d'Ivoire. I, I was uh, attending a, a, a meeting in, uh, in Dakar in uh, June, and uh, we went to this uh, popular restaurant. And uh, when the woman who was serving explained, uh, one of the participants from Morocco, it's like his eyes started to leave. Oh, you have a cheque? I said, what is your relation with that cheque? He said, but I worked at ADB in Abidjan, so don't you understand? And uh, last year, two years ago, the uh, uh, movie actor Danny Glover, who came here, and as a faculty fellow in Ujama, we organized an uh, uh, event. And um, at the end, I went to introduce myself. I said, I'm, I'm from Cote d'Ivoire. I said, Cote d'Ivoire, I check it. <laughs> so really, I, I find that all the time, all the time, uh, in part because Cote d'Ivoire became one of the most uh, uh, um, the countries in, in Africa with, with a, a pull factor where so many people from different countries, neighbor, uh, neighboring countries and far away migrated to. It's one of the countries in the world with the largest proportion of non-national, uh, more than um, one fourth of, of the people in Cote d'Ivoire, according to the census in the past few decades, consistently, even through the wars and all that, consistently through, uh, more than one fourth of the population is not Ivorian. So there has been, it has been what I have called those magnet countries in different regions of, of the continent. So Cote d'Ivoire has been a magnet country in West Africa in terms of its economy, and uh, that attracted so many people there. It's more complex than that, but it has been. And as a result, some of its commodities, some of its lifestyle have been adopted. Actually, when you go throughout West Africa and other countries, many in the culinary um, tradition now, you find the words, many words from my own uh, language. I check, uh, uh, well, uh, aloko, which is um, uh, plantain, yeah, ripe plantain. So it's now ac accepted as, a, you know, the word. Um, you find uh, kejenu. Kejenu is uh, when you cut pieces, it's like uh, the Jamaican jerk uh, uh, chicken. You cut it, you mix it with the ingredient, and you tie, you uh, cook it, uh, pressure cooking. And so it means, uh, literally in my language, shake. Shake it. It means <laughs> you, you cook it a little, and then uh, you take it, since you cannot open it to mix it, you take it and you shake it. That's what it means, kejenu. All these, if you go to other countries, you find them. So this is the context in which, and also urbanization, uh, that has led to the increasing significance of uh, cassava. Many of the uh, products that are, come out of cassava when you process it are more easily um, conserved than, for example, uh, product from, from um, uh, like yam and so and so forth. So this is the most popular all of uh, all of them. This acheke, <laughs> it looks very much, <laughs> very much like couscous, but it tastes different. It has a little bit of that sour taste, and that sour taste actually, I could tell you exactly the process. I have relatives who were uh, women who were involved in the cassava, and uh, a few among those women really become financially comfortable as a result of uh, being involved in the cassava uh, production. So I can tell you, I, if you give me some cassava, I can make a check here. <laughs> so, but uh, it has moved from the traditional way of making it, which was very arduous, very much uh, energy consuming. There have been uh, mechanization, uh, small technological invention have made it uh, possible to make the acheke without uh, the heavy uh, energy that was uh, involved in uh, earlier. Well, this has um, all the gender implications. 
And the, another gender implication is uh, the mechanization and uh, industrial production of cassava. It has many potential. Um, it's only the tuber that is used for human consumption. And in Cote d'Ivoire, historically, it was used only for human consumption. Even those who don't think it's real food, you eat it out of necessity. But it was used for, for human, not for animals. The leaves are very much prized and, and, and used as green in many parts of the African continent. But only a small group in the western part of Cote d'Ivoire uses it. Yet, it has been scientific, scientifically established that the leaves actually are richer in, in, uh, in protein mineral than the tuber itself, which is essentially composed of, of starch. And that's one of its problems. It has many problems. Uh, the bitter and sweet cassava, they all have um, uh, cyanide uh, of a certain proportion, things that are not good for human consumption. And if consumed regularly, it can lead to some diseases. Uh, that human diseases. So the, many of the research effort are to use cassava scientifically to um, extract those uh, 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 harmful uh, component and also to use it as a, as a substitute for many others. There is a factory in a, in a small town in, in Cote d'Ivoire where they have done a lot of experimentation uh, to Modi to see if they can use cassava to substitute uh, flour from uh, wheat that we do not produce as a way of reducing the money that is used for, for imported food. Uh, industrially, there's a lot of research that is being done by different uh, uh, organizations uh, uh, that I have the names uh, here in the paper, and uh, to find different ways you can make glue out of it for industrial uh, 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 use. You can use certain substance, the starch, in the process of producing uh, the, the textile. Um, you can use um, uh, different uh, components of the cassava to produce a lot of things uh, industrially. So it's a welcome development, this industrialization, large scale production, but it's taking away, little by little, women in the process. It's a very classical case. Uh, it's good to produce it at, on a large scale. It's very important to mechanize it. But at the same time, there's not a deliberate effort to think of the women who used to control it, to produce it. How do you bring them in the process? So we have this. Uh, uh, really contradictory situation where we think we're improving by um, taking the production at another level, but at the same time um, excluding, marginalizing women. Um, I have uh, gone really, uh, I, as I said, I have the paper, I decided not to go through it. So I, I probably have uh, skipped um, a few things. Um, so what I would like to mention in the end is this, uh, um, uh, the, the, what I just uh, said, the, the uh, exclusion of, of women, whether it is intentional or unintentional, uh, because of policies must be deliberate. You think of specific uh, populations when you're designing a policy, it's not generic. The society is, is uh, constructed in a, in a particular way. Uh, there's a certain culture. Uh, there are certain traditions. And all African traditions are not negative. There are many traditions that are very positive, particularly in terms of women capacity that I have, they have shown historically to manage, to produce. Uh, women are involved in world trade today in Africa more than, than men uh, because of that tradition. When they were producing in the farm, they were uh, processing the food that created an extension of additional activity, the market. The African market is not just a place where you go to exchange commodities. 
is a very powerful social space. Actually, during the colonial time, this is where women went and met, uh, organized their meeting, you know, planning what, how to respond to this colonial policy and so and so forth. Um, so um, all this uh, is uh, being um, left out as opposed to using it to uh, inform policy so that the social development, the economic development that is expected out of those policies, uh, some groups are not left out. And women, unfortunately, have been uh, left out in many of them. One of my books here, uh, edited book, Women uh, and Higher Education in Africa, um, Reconceptualizing Gender-Based Human Capabilities and Upgrading Human Right to Knowledge. This is one of the arguments I have been advancing, that you need to have education for women all the way, not only the literacy programs. You need to have them with the scientific knowledge, with the capacity to challenge those policies, the capacity to design or contribute to designing those policies in order to really reflect uh, the, um, uh, the sociological reality. If we wanted to follow African tradition, there would be today more women agricultural engineers than men, given that history. It's not the case. So it's not the African culture that produced that. The African culture had something else to teach us why we were not able to size that um, social capital, that, that cultural capital in order to design policies. So many things have been done and hiding behind the African culture. Uh, many of them are actually not founded. So I think I would like to stop here so that we can use the remainder of the time for, uh, for exchange. Again, I have suddenly left things out that I prepared in my paper, but I didn't want to give a big lecture. So, <laughs> so I thank you for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.